Hi, everyone. Welcome to our Handling SNP data workshop, everyone in person and online. Uh, my name is Emily. And I'm Haley. And we look forward to sharing what we've learned, um, hearing your questions, and interacting with you in person and over Zoom. Um, so let's just get started. Um, so we'd first like to begin by acknowledging the land on which we are gathering is the unceded traditional and unceded territory of the Muslim people. Additionally, we want to preface this session with the copyright information for all code and um, output produced by today's session. So, and your code uh, falls under this copyright as well. Um, so a bit about us. Um, my name is Emily and I just finished my master's in medical genetics. I literally defended a couple weeks ago, hooray. Um, and I was co-supervised by Drs. Jessica Dennis and Wendy Robinson at the Children's Institute. Um, and my thesis was titled Investigating Sex Differences in the Polygenic Risk of Major Depressive Disorder and Shared Associations with Cardiovascular Disease. Um, so I did my entire thesis with the data the data types that we're going to be going over in the workshop today. Um, and I, like hopefully some of you, will get to get to know you soon. I was a bit of a beginner, like up until a year and a half ago. I still sort of, I'm in an intermediate right now. So I can relate to a lot of you, hopefully in the chat, about the learning curve. Um, all the TAs in this room and Haley are a bit more advanced than me. So um, just full disclosure, if you ever have any tricks and tips for how to um, get started, I can try and help you out with that. Um, because my entire background before this was in wet lab and clinical research. I'm also currently still doing clinical research right now. Um, but my entire thesis was computational. Um, and my long term interests career wise are to apply what I've learned in this omics world into like clinical applications with, for example, pharmacogenomics or population screening programs like those kinds of things really appeal to me. Uh, I'm Haley. I am currently in my second year in medical genetics, also supervised by Dr. Jessica Dennis. Um, my work is more focused on psychiatric genetics. I have a dual background in both biology and psychology. Um, but additionally, I have some bioinformatics experience, uh, specifically four years of experience with R&R &R Studio. And most of my computational experience was acquired through two years at the National Cancer Institute. Uh, my thesis currently is focused on topics in psychiatric genomics with the knowledge translation piece to BC children's patients and families. Okay, and this next slide is just all the links for your reference. So we have our GitHub linked as well as our Slack feed. The Slack feed is also linked in the chat for anybody's reference. This is your location for any questions or discussions you might have during the session. Uh, feel free to enter them in the Zoom chat as well. Um, and we also have a feedback survey link in the slides, as well as a QR code you can just scan with your phone. This is anonymized, it just takes a few minutes and is great for our knowledge and feedback for teaching in the future. Okay, so we're also curious who you all are. So in real life, if you guys wanna put your hands up um, and then in Zoom, if you also wanna put your hands up, um, has anybody worked with genetic SNP data before? Okay, we have one person in real life. One person in real life. And let's see, see what the Zoom looks like. Oh, I see two in the Zoom. Two have raised hands in the Zoom. Okay. Cool. Um, how about, do you know what a genome-wide association study is? Who knows what a GLOS is? Okay, we have two in person. Two in person, and we have two, three, four, five, Three seven online eight. Oh, Ooh, we have many right. people. <laughs> many people know what a genome wide association is. Solid. Okay. But also a lot of people don't. So yes, that is okay. We are true. gonna go over everything today. This yeah. is just helpful for us to know for adjusting our language. Baseline. Baseline. Okay. Have you ever worked with R or Studio before? Okay, we have three one person, three out of three. Well, I assume from earlier sessions, hopefully you guys have experience with R and R Studio. And additionally, command line. Has anybody worked with command line previously? Seems like around half the people in seems like half the chat in Zoom have 
experience with our studio and command line. Um, maybe the majority, but there does seem to be a minority of people who do not have that experience, and that is totally okay. Um, we just do encourage you to look through the earlier Precision Health Bootcamp workshops with the Intro to Art Studio, Intro to Singularity, Intro to all those things. <laughs> Otherwise, we might the content of these slides might just have assumed knowledge about that you know certain things. Mm -hmm. So, and the question we're most curious about is if you want to write in the Zoom chat, and then if you want to offer in person what your areas of interest or research are. Um, so, for example, I'm really interested in psychiatric genetics. Emily's really interested in psychiatric genetics and cardiogenetics. I know some people are interested in cancer genetics. So, um, if you want to just shout it out. Feel free. Or like put your hand up. We'd love to know it um, in person. Let's ask in person people, what are your topic interests? Um, I'm working in the pulmonary disease and pulmonary disease. Pulmonary and disease. Pulmonary. So we have yeah. pulmonary disease yeah. day yeah. here. I'm working for heart and lung innovation. Oh, right. that's hospital. oh already July. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, July. You know, July. I used to work there for a year, yeah. Oh, okay, that's great to know. Yeah, so and, uh, our lab generates mm. some maybe <clears throat> morphological data, I mean, combining morphological data and then maybe the omics data, but then both the trans the transforming the omics data for the omics, something like that. Mm -hmm. yeah, Very cool. 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 So okay. just to repeat for the recording and for Zoom, um, we have someone in person who's working with multi-omics and integrating morphology and omics data in a pulmonary context, which is cool. Mm -hmm. And we also have some in the chat. We have some cancer genetics, cardiogenetics, and neurogenetics, and so on, developmental biology, immunology. immunology, diabetes, rare disease. Rare disease is really cool. Proteomics. Okay, awesome. So what we're going to be discussing today. The other oh. two. <laughs> yeah, oh, the other two girls. Do you guys want to offer? Okay. You sure? Okay. The other two have the one. Sure. Mm. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you everyone for sharing. That's yes. really helpful for us to know. And, you know, also if you wanted to DM each other in the chats one on one, this is a networking opportunity. <laughs> um, thank you. Um, all right. So let's get into the content for today. Um, so we're going to start off the morning workshop. So there's two halves, right? There's the morning and then there's the afternoon. Morning is kind of setting the stage. So we're going to be discussing SNPs versus SNVs. So that stands for single nucleotide polymorphisms versus single nucleotide variants. Um, we're going to discuss some detail quality control steps of SNPs and um, how to execute those in Plink. This is a very important step that people often glaze through in other courses or other kind of teaching pipelines. We want to emphasize that this is a pretty important step, um, depending on your population of interest. Um, and describing the three SNP file formats. So we have Plink.bed.bim.fam formats, we have VCF, and we have GWAS summary statistics. Um, so the expectations for today, for both sessions, is that these are not code along workshops. So we're not going to be sharing our screen and giving you guys code to like input and do things by yourself. You could just sit back and listen and enjoy, but you can also, if you choose to interact with the code, you can try and customize it for your own data. You can work with your own summary statistics. You can be as involved as you want to be, essentially. Um, so it's mostly lecture based. Um, so. We're going to go over concepts and key code chunks. I'll be flipping between websites and my R, my R markdowns, um, and everything is on our Scratch space, and um, which is linked in one of the earlier slides. And um, also, some of the files are on GitHub. So please feel free to go over it at your own leisure time. Um, there's a lot to cover today, so we don't expect you guys to be experts <laughs> at the end of this. This is kind of to let you guys know that these things exist um, and to be a reference for future. Um, interest in these areas. Um, so we'd like to ask if you could ask questions in the Zoom chat, please, um, and not unmute yourself, please write in the Zoom chat first. And our TAs, Charlie Barkley, Selen, and um, Rhiannon are going to try their best to answer them, and they will alert us um, if like, we should cover something verbally in person. Um, and yeah, so at the end, um, we're probably going to have at least half an hour to ask questions and play with the code um, before the 11 o'clock. Um, so yeah, um, that's that slide. So, okay, I meant, I said earlier slide, I meant the next slide. <laughs> so our code is in this um, directory. So I love using this thing called Cyberduck, which Phil hates, but <laughs> it's a nice visual to show you guys where everything is. Um, and this is good for Macs. 
So Cyberduck is an app like this. Um, so you can see here, this is our, um, our directory. Um, and please make sure that you have your own directory. Um, we didn't ask at the beginning how many of you have attended previous PHI workshops, but basically, um, if you haven't made your own directory, please make one in this workshops slash student spaces, and please navigate to that. And you can feel free to copy the entire SNP Association's um, content if you would like. Um, there are some big files in there, like summary statistics and Plank files are quite big, so it'll take some time. Um, and you can use this if you'd like. Um, so for example, if we navigate to student spaces here, you can see like everyone's stuff is here. So yeah. Um, do, do, do. So yeah, if you're having trouble with this, um, the TAs will hopefully be there to help navigate any troubleshooting, um, and especially with code. All right. So getting into the content, um, again, this is kind of like a lecture based workshop with some coding content, but we really want to make sure you have the understanding of the fundamentals. Um, so a single nucleotide polymorphism, um, the difference between a SNP and a SNV is that a SNP occurs in at least 1% of the population, whereas variants can be in less than 1%. Um, so a single variation is the substitution of one um, deoxynucleotide um, like base pair from like an A, for example, here to a C. And there are different types of SNPs. Some of them can keep the same um, amino acid coded. Um, those are called um, synonymous mutations. And then non-synonymous mutations change um, the resulting amino acid sequence um, a little bit. So for example, here, a histidine is changed to proline when an A SNP is substituted for a C. And sometimes these can result in um, deleterious mutations. So these are um, pretty big deal mutations. Um, but you also might have SNPs in non-exon coding regions. So an exon is basically what codes for proteins here. Um, a lot of SNPs happen in introns, which are the areas in between exons that um, do not get transcribed into mRNA. Um, and it's getting increasingly recognized that introns are actually quite important um, for regulation. And you can have alternative splicing. So they're very important for making different proteins um, out of the same gene. So, you know, if you have an intron mutation, an intron SNP, it might actually disrupt intron splicing. Um, so when you're looking at rationale in your area of expertise for excluding non-exonic SNPs, be, be critically thinking about why. Um, a lot of complex diseases actually have SNPs that are in regulatory regions that are implicated, um, which I'll go into in a bit. Um, so the other things I didn't mention are the untranslated regions and um, the upstream regions. So we have regulatory sequences like here in red um, that are upstream of the actual gene, which can control if a gene is transcribed or not. So a lot of times transcription factors and other binding elements need to actually bind to that DNA and contort the, the like nearby DNA for a gene to be transcribed, like the machinery needs to be in a specific configuration. Um, so you can imagine that SNPs that disrupt the ability of those proteins to bind could disrupt the ability of the gene to turn on at all, right? So the gene might be fine. You might have no mutations in the gene itself, but if you have genes upstream that affect the ability for the gene to turn on, like that could be the deleterious effect. Um, the other important thing to mention for this workshop is that what we're covering is expect is just kind of talking about SNPs, like single, these like little substitutions of one base pair for another. We're not going to be going over how to manipulate or how to analyze insertions and deletions or called indels, um, copy number variants or structural variants like translocations where a chunk of the genome can be like copy pasted into a different part of the genome or like switched around. Um, those are completely like different techniques and like very, beyond the scope of this current workshop. Um, but I think Phil has experience. So there might be more in the precision health space in the near future about how to do those kinds of things. Um, so yeah, please manage expectations that we're not going through those specific things. Um, so why do we care? So I kind of alluded to how mutations in different parts of the genome can have different effects, but um, 
there's this really kind of canonical GWAS graph here that shows how most um, common variants are implicated in common diseases and rare variants with high effect sizes can cause um, these things called Mendelian disease. So for example, um, cystic fibrosis is a classic example where you have a mutation in this like one transporter gene and you have this huge effect on this phenotype, like this huge effect of producing mucus and like having cystic fibrosis. That's called a high penetrant allele. And they are typically very rare in the population because they're deleterious. Um, natural selection, like they're selected against and um, it reduces um, the likelihood that that gene will be passed on to the next generation. Um, so the, res the result is that a lot of variants get passed on to the next generation if they confer little to medium risk in certain contexts, which means that common diseases are very polygenic. So many common variants with small effect sizes cumulatively um, influence overall risk of disease. And that is the focus of today's workshop. Because the reality is that it seems like from the chat, a lot of you guys are working with complex diseases, complex traits, um, not just disease. You can study things like height, intelligence, all those controversial behavioral genetics things. Um, those are all polygenic. Um, so yeah, so the field of genetics did start mostly with Mendelian disorders just because of sample sizes and power and technology. But really in the last 10 years, um, a lot of technology and computational resources have been developed to enable us to have to scale up essentially to have hundreds of thousands of people in biobanks to have really strong power and sample size to be able to find these genetic variants that confer risk to disease um, so i hope that the importance of this material is not lost <laughs> from that introduction and i'll pass the baton to haley now yeah so what can we do with the SNPs once we actually determine which SNPs are involved in a certain disease? So we can deduce pathways involved in this disease phenotype by enrichment analysis, but we can also determine um, from a study like a genome-wide association study, which variants are actually causal, causally related to the disease phenotype um, beyond just the gene variants. We can look at cell types in which the variants act through SNP enrichment. And we can also look at which genes are actually being regulated by those variants. Since genes, we can't assume that since a SNP is over a gene, it's directly affecting that gene through co-localization. And so through this workshop, we hope to help you get started in um, kind of analyzing these SNPs and taking this data and making it useful for your work. OK, so to start off with SNP data, the most important part is quality control. So regardless of formatting of your data, you should understand your quality control steps with SNP data specifically. So the most common considerations are the minor allele frequency, which is the commonness of your uh, SNPs. Um, additionally, with strand flipping, so this is your um, allele frequency, your minor allele frequency, which we'll get into later. Um, sex mismatch, uh, as well as genotyping and batch discordance, and Hardy, Hardy Weinberg equilibrium. And we'll go over each of these steps um, individually. And there's a comprehensive review on this quality control for these SNP arrays in uh, LinkedIn here. So for the minor allele frequency, the minor allele frequency is the rate at which the second most common allele in the population occurs. This can also be indicated in um, data sets as the opposite allele. So this can be the effect allele frequency as well. So that would be the most common allele or the allele that is um, of interest. So it can be indicated differently in different data sets. So rare is typically a um, frequency of less than 0.05 variants in a population, but these variants might be common in one sample versus another. So these sources of variation in the minor allele frequency might include genetic ancestry ancestry differences, um, so founders and bottlenecks. And so 
yes. So when we set, um, we can set thresholds and specific analyses for the minor allele frequency for what you would consider whether a SNP is common or rare. Sometimes it's different um, for different diseases. So for defaults is 0 0.05. I think for some um, softwares, the default is 0 0.01. But you also should consider your sample size when looking at these very uncommon alleles and setting your thresholds. Um, so the next quality control consideration are discordance and call rates. Um, so the previous slide was talking about natural variation that actually occurs in the population. Um, discordance and call rate differences in SNPs. For example, if you have nine people that have a T and then one person has an A, you want to know, is that a real A? Is that a real minor allele? Or is that a error in the experimental setup? Um, so this quality control step is for the latter, to know if it's um, discordant across other sample replicates. Um, so basically, discordance and call rates are kind of interchanged a lot. Um, it's the proportion or percentage of samples in which a confident genotype call can be made. Um, so for those in the audience that are not um, super genetics -y, um, a genotype is basically a catch-all definition for someone's genetic material. So a genotype can sometimes refer to just one allele, like one base pair, like one A, like an A um, or T or C or G could be the genotype. And then other people sometimes refer to the genotype with regards to the entire gene, like which allele, like which product <laughs> comes out of your gene. So that can include multiple, like the output of multiple base pairs. So genotype, I just want to mention to the crowd is that it's a bit of a context dependent um, word. And thus this discordance and call rates quality control step could refer to indels as well. So you want to be you want to be 100 percent sure or like 99 percent sure or over 95 percent sure that you are confident that the um, SNP that you were getting is a real thing, especially for the rarer, um, the, the, the more, what's it called, true, the true positives. <laughs> you want to lower the false positives, right? Um, next, we have sex mismatch samples. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, my entire thesis was about sex differences. So we want to make sure that we understand that sex is not gender, okay? So sex is a biological definition that is usually determined by chromosome pairings, and how people present with like external genitalia usually, and people might have a sex that is not their gender. Um, gender is a socially um, constructed term that does differ by societies and um, is usually regarding to how people present themselves visually, how they act, different roles, etc. cetera. Um, so we might have people with um, compliments that are not the same, which is, valid and fine. Um, and we might also have people who have um, atypical or not atypical, who have less common um, chromosome pairings, such as 45X, where someone is missing a second um, sex chromosome, or they have 47XXY, which is that they have an extra X chromosome. Um, and of note, there is an SRY um, gene on the Y chromosome that is um, the that turns on very early in development. And if the SRY gene does not turn on, maleness does not develop. So SRY is essentially the turn on for the reproductive tracts of, ma of males. So it is possible for people to have a 46XY genotype, but express, but be phenotypically female because of the lack of SRY expression. So when you're dealing with real patient samples, um, and real people, sometimes you don't know what someone's genotype is until you do these kinds of um, tests. And people often just test for the SRY. So if you test for the presence of SRY, you can see if someone is genotypically male. Um, but people also do dose, they can also look at dose differences between the X. So if you have one dose versus two doses of the X, you can tell how many X chromosome pe um, people have. So an important consideration is that the X chromosome is often excluded from a lot of geno genetic studies um, to the point where it doesn't make sense because as of 2014, there's lots of methods online um, for you to, in to include the X chromosome in your samples. Um, 
my XX people have one X typically inactivated to account for the dose differences between males and females. Um, so that's a whole process that I won't go into in depth, but just please be aware that there's dosage differences in X inactivation. Um, PARS, P-A-R-S, is pseudo-autosomal regions. So the X chromosome and the Y chromosome actually do share some homologous regions in, in common. Um, so it is as if the males have two doses of the same gene. So for example, on the tips of the, of the Y chromosome, they have the same genes as like the tips of the X chromosome. Um, so PARS are an important consideration. Um, and also, especially for those of you in the immunology sphere, a lot of immune genes are on the X, like FOXP3, we have like estrogen receptor genes, we have like a lot <laughs> going on in the X. And if you throw out the X, which is one of the biggest chromosomes, like you can see here visually, it's one of the biggest compared to like chromosome five, if you're throwing out the X, you're throwing out a lot of potentially important data. So that's something to please be aware of. Um, just because it's regular in your lab, I would like everyone to think critically about why you're throwing it out. Um, second important thing is sex stratifying versus regressing sex out as a covariate. So um, when people say that they control for sex or they control for variables, what they mean is that they are regressing it out in their models. And if there are sex differences in the biology of your disease, in the mechanisms of your disease, you are not able to see that as shown in this top graph, because you're kind of just adjusting for the sex as a variable, assuming that the trends are the same. That's not true for a lot of disease. So I highly encourage you to consider sex stratifying your data, seeing if the same trends exist across both sexes. And then if the same trend does exist, then sure, you can justify regressing it out. Um, an important thing to note is that often people cite that you're lowering power when you sex stratify. Um, and this is true only if there are not sex differences. However, if there are true biological sex differences, you might actually be increasing the power to detect those differences. Um, you can think of it like a confidence interval. So if you have two, like females might have like a lower expression of one thing and then males have a higher one. If you're assuming that they're the same, the signal will look like it's somewhere in the middle and it'll be a huge confidence interval. Whereas if you have them separate, you're going to have a narrower confidence interval that reflects the true pattern of the gene expression or the outcome of interest. Um, so this is something that's not really emphasized in a lot of research teams. So I'd highly recommend people just look into literature. Are there sex differences in prevalence or ideology? And um, bring this to your research. Next quality control step is Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. So uh, one reason SNPs may um, differentiate is population um, effects. So purifying selection, reading, population substructure, copy number variation, genotyping error. Um, there's two types of uh, deviation from Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. So there's gain of heterozygosity, which is suggested for genotyping error. And then there's loss of heterozygosity, which points to more natural variabilities like population substructure or common deletion polymorphisms. So you can have these thresholds for your Hardy-Weinberg Hardy equilibrium, depending on your sample size um, to control for these departures from Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium for whatever population effect is occurring in your population of interest. Okay, so for what we'll be covering today, we'll just be covering three main file formats. Um, Plink binary, which is the bed fan and bin files, variant call format, which is the .bcf, and summary statistics, which is any output from a genome-wide association study. And we have linked in this um, slide a really great resource for genomic file types that I use. One is at the National Cancer Institute um, that has uh, kind of a format layout for each different genetic uh, data type and uh, examples for how you can work with these different data types. So I think it's a great resource for future reference. Okay. So introduction to Plink. Plink is a command line package for working with SNP data. We also have the website for Plink linked in here, and we're going to look at some of the key aspects of Plink, um, especially the file structure or how the website looks, because the website is pretty um, 
farce, I guess, <laughs> if you want to open it. Yeah, you can put it in the drive. Okay, so most of your resources that you're going to need for this um, lecture in particular are in your data management section. So everything is ordered along the sidebar here, but they also have the same headers up top. So we're going to be working mostly with our data management section, but they also do have sections that are great for just reference. Um, So this facts section is great for looking at commonly um, needed troubleshooting codes and uh, flags that you might need for working with different data types. Okay, so for the Plink file format specifically, there's three separate files. The bed file is a binary genotype matrix. If you try and read this in your command line, you won't, it won't be uh, pretty. The, output is kind of a mess. Um, the BIM file is the variant information for this genotype matrix. This will look like a list of variants and whatever information is available depending on where you've gotten your data from. And then the .fam file is participant information for that genotype matrix. So specific um, individual information for each of those variants. So a package we use for reading this into, for reading this file format into Plink is, or for reading this into R is Genio. Um, and we'll cover this more in the afternoon session with uh, the Leo copy information. And I'll hand it over. No, this is a system. Oh, is this done? Yeah. Yes. Okay. So we can do quality control in Plink. We have an individual data, individual level data file um, available for you. That's just the one kg data. So we have a script available for QCing this 1000 genome data. If you would like to try this yourself. So you just have to copy the BAM bed and BIM files and use this 1kg or qc.pbs file, uh, replace Emily's email with yours, and you can try different uh, thresholds, so your minor allele frequency thresholds, and see how results for your QC change. So your output will be um, however many variants uh, were selected after QC and however many participants were still passed um, filters in QC as well. Uh, any questions? Anything to? Yeah. Um, if you have any questions about this script, um, you can direct them to the TAs. Um, but you can kind of, and if you can go to Plink and, or just go to Google and be like, what does mind in Plink mean? Um, so the project folder for the Precision Health Workshop, we're directing you to. Um, use the plank that's there. Um, so that's what this line means. And if you want to fiddle around with the math of 0 0.05, you can change it to 0 0.01. If you want to change Hardy-Weinberg to be 0 point, like 1 times 10 to the negative 6, you can see how the outputs change based on changing those parameters. Um, and for the trainees out there, I was asked in my thesis defense why I chose different thresholds. Um, so it's one of those things where, for example, if you're looking at a diverse population, if you're looking at people who are not of the same genetic ancestry, um, you'll be asked to justify why you chose a minor allele threshold, minor allele frequency or a Hardy-Weinberg threshold. So for example, European ancestry only, or are you looking at people with European, African, East Asian, South Asian, admixed people, people with multiple genetic ancestries kind of all mixed? Depending on your experimental design, you will have to use different thresholds and justify your use of those things. Um, so please be aware of those aspects of your population. Okay, and the second file type I'm gonna be discussing is the variant call format. So you can convert between that Plink binary format file and this variant call format file using Plink. Um, you can also use Plink to select regions from a, or from a file if you don't want to work with an entire genome and you just want to work with a specific chromosome or even a specific um, region between two base pairs on a chromosome. And I'll be showing the code for that later. 
So the variant call format is a single file. You have the rows as the variants and then columns as that variant information that you would see in that bin file. But additionally, that participant information that you would have seen in that FAM file. Um, and something to consider with both VCF files and the PLIC files is to which genome build your genome is aligned. There's currently three main reference builds for the genotype. Um, and each of these have different gene locations and also different variant information across builds. So it's important to consider when you're working with um, this data type, uh, what your alignment actually is for your genome type. At this point, I should, we should probably mention that there are different ways to acquire SNP data um, and the kind of the point of alignment. Um, there might be a lot of gaps in your data and alignment and other methods are kind of to make sure that your data is correct. Um, and like filling in the gaps like with imputation, if you're working with sequence data versus genotype data versus imputed data, those are all different um, assumptions, um, which we're not going to cover in depth right now. But if you want to talk about it at the end of the session, we're happy to talk about um, different kind of entry. Yeah, Ways. genome, this isn't, we're going to not, we're not going to cover actual genome alignment, but we will, it, it is something to consider if you're working with SNP data from wherever you're getting. Yeah. Okay, so from our third file type that we're going to be talking about is from genome-wide association studies. So these are measures of genetic variation measured as the single nucleotide polymorphisms associated with a trait or disease. Um, SNP data is often presented like below in Manhattan plots where we see the dots are individual SNPs and we see a significance line um, for genome-wide significance as the dotted red line. Um, something else to note is that you might be wondering why are all these dots in a vertical line next to each other? Um, we didn't exp explicitly mention this earlier, but there's this concept called linkage disequilibrium. I'm going to talk about that later. Which we're going to talk about later. Yeah. Let's so talk about that in, in a hot second. Yeah. Yeah. So just in case you're wondering, like, why are there so many dots next to each other? We're going to get to that. <laughs> yes. That's the struggle with GWAS is that we yeah. get a lot of low. We get a lot of SNPs at single <laughs> loci and it can get very complicated very fast. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, additional considerations with GWAS is that we, um, there's a lot of, qualities that can bias the results, which is important for the bigger picture in looking at these SNP associations. So some considerations include sample size, um, depending on how large your GWAS is, um, sex differences in a trait, uh, genetic ancestry, specifically that race, uh, genetic ancestry is not the same as race or ethnicity. These are distinct measures. Um, and the way genetic ancestry is often measured in a genome-wide association study is as a principal component of genetic ancestry, and we're not going to be covering this in this workshop, but this is just one way of measuring genetic ancestry in one of these samples. Um, we also have genotyping chip biases in which SNPs are picked, so how they were informed, where they were informed from. Um, and then correction for multiple associations, we saw that uh, p-value line was um, up further. It's at 5 times 10 to the negative 8. This is to adjust for multiple associations, because obviously when we're doing, doing genome-wide analyses, we're looking at each gene associated with the trait. So we have to account for all of those associations at once. Um, and then we have to take into account thresholds for those SNP quality controls like we just mentioned in the past slides. So with sample size, a uh, very small sample can definitely bias the results towards false positives, but also just results in very messy data, um, as we'll see. We'll see in a good example of this later. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. And if you have if you have questions about what multiple testing is, um, we can talk about that after. Um, it's an important concept statistically. All right, so we're nearing the end of the lecture portion of the workshop. We're going to go into the code soon, um, but 
until there, um, GWAS summary statistics. I want to direct us to two resources. So first one is to explore the GWAS catalog. So the GWAS catalog is an online repository that does have curators at the NIH that do kind of go through all these studies. And it's basically a place, a catch-all for all sorts of studies of all traits. Um, so let's look at Alzheimer's maybe. If I search in your disease of interest, you get this kind of result where you get different um, traits and measurements and then publications kind of in orange and green here. Um, so if we look at the biomarker measurement, for example, here, there's 281 studies, there's tons of them. And you can explore this at your own um, leisure, but I just, just want to show you guys what it looks like if it loads. <laughs> um, uh, while that loads, I'll go back here. Um, and you can also search things like specific genes, so APOE, and you can see which traits are associated with the gene of interest. So it kind of goes multiple ways, and you can also go into specific SNPs, like it's quite a good resource, and it's not loading, um, but that's okay. Um, so the important thing is that to just realize that with the GWAS catalog, all the authors that submit papers there can like format their GWAS summary statistics in different ways. So that's the main bottleneck learning curve wise is to be like, okay, there's all these GWAS summary statistics that I can choose from for my disease of interest. How do I choose one? Which one should I choose? What do I do with it? And rule of thumb is to try and mimic a population that like you're trying to like think about qualities like sample size, genetic ancestry, sex differences, if it's sex ratified or not, um, et cetera. Um, so it is up to your discretion of your team to choose which summary statistics file. Um, but for the purposes of today's workshop, I want us to look at the UKB, UK Biobank's Neil Lab website. Um, so again, I mentioned at the beginning, like this can be a workshop where you just like listen to the lecture and just hang out. Um, but if you do want to get more involved and like try playing around with known data for your trade of interest, um, you can download summary statistics from the UKB from this resource, which I'll show you in a second and um, try and follow the script shared in this subdirectory, um, the GWAS preparation subdirectory, um, which I'll be covering in the next few slides. And the important thing is that all of the UKB Neil Lab um, resources are formatted the same way, so you can copy the script verbatim. But if you want to adapt the script to a different GWAS sum stats from the GWAS catalog, you're going to have to do some, some playing around that is not, that's beyond the scope of this current workshop. Um, so if you go into this link, um, you can see the biobank and this GWAS results page, and you click this GWAS round two results can be found here. And you'll get directed to this like giant Google sheet. <laughs> um, and there's always people lurking. And it's thousands of rows long. Um, so literally, they have all the traits and all the measurements captured in the UK Biobank, which is literally thousands of variables. So it's actually quite interesting. And the other important thing is that they have combined, so both sexes data where they regress sex out as a covariate, as well as sex stratified data. So this is surprisingly really not common. <laughs> like it's really not common for authors to sex stratify their GWASs. Um, so if you can find them, that's amazing. Um, so like, I'll just do another Alzheimer's, you know, if we have illnesses, you know, we have stuff here, you can control F. Um, if you want to, so for example, if you want to do like coronary heart disease, like they do have a bunch of like detailed things as well as history of a major event. Um, so, yep. So the way that you extract data Actually, before we get to that, um, I will show you a couple of examples of how different the summary statistics can look. Um, so I mentioned how in the GWAS catalog, they can all be different. Here are two examples. So example one, we have nicely parsed out data. We have the RSID in one. We have the major allele and the minor allele. We have the frequency of the minor allele. We have the log odds ratio of the effect size of having that allele um, as conferred with the trait. We have the standard error of that log OR, and then we have the p-value. All nicely parsed out. Um, odds ratios and beta values are the two. Sorry, I'm like, so mm -hmm. interrupt. In this kind of p value, mm -hmm. generally tells that how uh, low size is associated with genotype or, or whatever. 
what does that mean? Yeah, it's the variance association with the trade of interest. Trade so this is the trade of interest. Statistics. Oh, yes. Okay. Yeah, good question. The oh. question was asking, so we're going to repeat questions that are asked in person over Zoom. So um, we had a question quickly from the audience about what does the p-value mean? Um, and as to Haley just said, it's association with the trade. Um, so here we can see that um, beta values are typically used for binary traits and log odds ratios can be for quantitative traits. Um, and here in the second example, you can see that there's a lot of extra columns here and they used beta values here. Um, we have a directionality thing. We have all these random extra columns, including the sample sizes of cases and controls. Um, and for these kinds of really fluffy summary statistics, these authors always have an accompanying readme document unique to the study that will delineate what all these things mean. Um, but the important thing as a new learner is to recognize the important ones, which are like the SNP ID, the major minor allele, your effect size estimate, your p-value, and the standard error. Um, so circling back to the new lab, um, for this workshop, we're working with a migraine data. Um, and all the code is here in an R markdown, which we'll go through in a bit. Um, but if you want to go to that Excel spreadsheet, again, you don't have to, you can just listen. Um, but if you want to, you can find the wget column. So if you kind of go back here, there's a wget link here in the wget command. And in your student space, you can just press wget and then just like pop it in. Um, and it'll take some time to download and you'll have to untar it. Um, right. So you're going to have to, so I put the code here, like MV is just renaming it. And then if you gun zip it, um, it's like, that's the code for the migraine one. Um, you can change it as you want. Um, and then in R you can read it like this and then look at the header and just kind of explore. So why did I choose, or why did we choose to use migraines? Um, well, it's a very genetically influenced complex trait characterized by episodes of moderate to severe headaches, um, most often unilateral and generally associated with nausea and increased sensitivity to light and sound. It's highly prevalent. So this is a common trait. 12% um, of the population is usually affected. Um, and there's a huge sex difference. So around 17% of women and 6% of men are each year. Um, and typically the prevalence does have an age association. So it increases during puberty, continues until 35 to 39, and then decreases later in life, especially after menopause. Um, so a lot of complex traits like migraines have a genetic and an environmental component. Um, so whenever you're doing genetic association studies or working with this kind of data, you should really be cognizant of all the environmental and physiological covariates that might also be influencing your trait. Um, for example, if you're looking at a GWAS of heart disease, are you looking at young people or old people? Or, or older people, sorry, older. <laughs> What's the age range? Um, for migraines, are you looking at a data set of 20-somethings or a data set of 30-somethings or a data set of 50-somethings? Because um, that, that can influence the genetic um, traits that you, the genetic risk factors you see. Um, back to migraines, it's highly heritable. Um, so heritability estimates like this one from 30 to 60 percent are usually based on something called family studies, um, which are kind of small sample size, but like high, um, like you're able to detect real signal, genetic signal from small data sets because they're all related. Um, and like I mentioned, having a trait heritability of 30 to 60 percent is like 60 percent of the trait is variation in the trait is associated with um, genetic variation. And the rest of that the rest of the 40 to 70% is environment. So triggers, um, environmental context with like, I don't know, pollution and green space, um, the physiological environment, how much endogenous estrogen do you have or egg, um, endogenous testosterone or cortisol interacting as transcription factors with your genes of interest. So environment can mean internal to your body, like your internal physiological bio environment, or it can also mean your social environment and like your physical environment outside inside of you. Um, so those are all things to consider when evaluating how genetic your trait is. Um, and the last thing of note is that um, in the UK Biobank data, um, they reported a snipwise heritability of around 10%, um, but this is lower than 
this um, because SNP wise is not counting for other measures of heritability that go into this. Um, and the UK Biobank noted a sex bias and a lower prevalence than in the general population estimates. Um, so I'm just going to show you what where I got that from. So if you go to the UKB, like there's, you can find your navigate from the link I sent earlier. Um, they have these for all the traits. Um, and you can see the SNP heritability here. And you can see confidence rating, significant levels, and they do report little flags like this, like what's their confidence? Um, and they say sex bias and the phenotype may impact interpretability. So I will show you what that means um, in a couple of slides. So the main roadblock that you might encounter with summary statistics is when a column, like if the summary statistics report their data like this. So I showed in earlier examples on slide 25 and 26, they had the RSID and the chromosome and the allele frequency and the base pair all nicely separated into separate columns. But unfortunately, there is like, this is a somewhat common practice where authors actually combine everything into one column. And you, ne you need to do this parsing step where you take that information out and put them in their own columns. Um, so this workshop, um, will help you learn how to get that data that you need using one pipeline that was developed in-house. Um, but of course, you can figure out your own code to parse it out. Like it's not a one, it's not a one size fits all. Um, like people have different ways of doing this. We're just offering one tool. Um, so that pipeline is also under here. Um, Sorry. Um, I mean, in the example in the in the six line. And with the major layer C and C or A, but the minor layer is C. But in this C, so whether it's major layer or minor layer, so in the six line, six row. Oh, no, sorry, in the fifth, fifth row. And the major layer is C and A, and the minor is C. So I'm um, wondering. Uh, do you have any explanations for these? The, okay, so the question is asking, and is there an explanation for why the major and minor allele are in the order that they are? Why there's two. Because, why there's because two? Because we can say there's that thousands, thousands in the fifth row is that is both major allele and minor allele. But uh, for example, in a people or in a group of people in a population, this kind of group has the thousands in this position. And then whether it's a major allele or minor allele. So determining if something is a major or minor allele requires a large population sample because then yeah. you can determine the relative frequency. Yeah. So a major allele would be the one that's the most common proportion wise. So a C in a European population might be the major allele, but in an Asian population it might be the minor allele. Okay. So you, so you determine major versus minor, it's all context dependent to your population. Oh, okay, so different population may have a different population. Correct. Oh, okay, thank you, Amit. That's a, that's a great question. And this is also the yeah. biggest problem when people use like a VCF compared to yeah. uh, this format, because VCF is all relative to the reference genome where there is no major or minor concept. It's what is the reference and what is your sample? Oh, okay. So mm -hmm. sometimes, there's a, that's one of the biggest problems is and why you have the quality controls because you have the splitting, which I think they're going to talk about. Oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, so Phil, just for those online who didn't catch Phil's answer or addition, was that um, when you're doing alignment considerations, um, you need to be aware of these assumptions with what the minor and major allele are um, based on your population to the reference build. Um, that's, I think, capturing what Phil said in a nutshell. Yeah, great. Um, so we'll go through this code shortly. I'm just going to show you the last slide and then we're going to kind of go through the RMD together. Um, so basically, um, you can also visualize, um, your Manhattan plots, your GWAS summary statistics using these things called Manhattan plots. Again, I have code in the RMD for how to produce these. Um, so it's helpful to get a visual if it looks good or not. Um, and there are statistical tests you can do with the genomic inflation factor 
and quantile quantile plots, QQ plots, to see if there is inflation in your SNPs due to population stratification or bias. Um, so you can read up on this later if you are really keen on doing this. Um, you want a range of an inflation factor between 1 and 1.1. So over 1 indicates actual polygenicity, but if it's over 1.1, you have to kind of tread carefully, and that might show that there's bias in your population. Um, for example, if you were looking at autoimmune disease prevalence and you went to like a rheumatology ward to get your patient samples, that's an example of bias. All your patients or all your samples are have the thing of interest, you're going to have this huge inflated factor, right? Um, that's an example. Um, another example is if you have a highly inbred or like a highly like a lot of cousins and third cousins who marry each other, you might have inflated frequency of certain SNFs just because of like a lot of interrelatedness in your population data. So that's another common source of inflation. Um, and here's a perfect example of sex differences in the data. Um, if you look, this was from the sex stratified data sets. So the female uh, migraine and then the male one. This looks like a nice Manhattan plot. You have these distinct little towers of SNPs. Um, whereas this is messy and wrong. <laughs> um, so just FYI, if you're trying to parse out a good quality versus a bad quality, it's usually quite obvious from visualization as well as these factors. So that's it for the lecture component, um, an hour in. So now we're gonna kind of go through the code. Um, so, um, Haley, do you want to say anything else before I load up? I think my last takeaway from this last slide is if you can't pick a locus you would be interested in, you might not, GWAS might not be the best method for you. That's a good point. All right. Sorry, you that again? If you can't pick a locus you're interested in, then GWAS probably isn't the right method for your sample at the time. Like if from your results, so from the male sample in that GWAS, if you can't, like you can't pick a position on the genome you would be interested in because they're all, there's significant oh, positions okay. everywhere. But even from the one on the left, how do you decide between your towers? That's a good question. We're going to talk about that later. A little bit, yeah. A little bit. Looking forward to it. Yeah, so when you're deciding between your towers, when you're looking at looking for SNFs, that's something called fine mapping. Um, and Haley's going to go over that in the afternoon session. So in the afternoon session, we're going to be going over applications of these data. Um, so, I mean, if you want a sneak preview, you can scroll through the slides. But um, for now, we're just going to go through the scripts that we talked about um, or we alluded to in the slides. Um, so going back to the 1000 genomes quality control steps at the beginning, if you open the PBS file, um, it seems like a lot of people in the room don't have a lot of experience with the with the HPC or the command line. So I'm just gonna kind of explain what this is quickly. Um, when you're working on Sockeye, you have to do these things called jobs. And to submit a job, you need to make these scripts. So a .sh is a shell script, .pbs is a PBS script. Um, and in here you write instructions directing like how much memory you need, wall time, et cetera. Um, dash N is for the name, A is allocation. Um, importantly, we have to use stturv1 and not the precision health one. So careful with that. Um, AB is per permission, mail? No, AB is the mail. Mailing it's preferences. Like when, yeah, when it alerts you to right. when the thing is starting or not. What Haley said. And then your email here, and then output and error. Um, so when you're changing your directory, making sure that like the PBS script is in your um, working directory, activating Plink using this code, and then we have all these flags here. Um, TAs, are there any questions around this? Yeah. Can you please explain again what the sizing, what's the difference between different sizes and why is it so important? Like, so, for example, like it says one kilogram or like there's like different numbers on there. You mentioned something about it was very important. Like you need to know, well, like how do you know? That's a, that's a good question. That's a really good question. Um, so in the audience, we had someone ask, how do you know which thresholds, like how big um, 
these thresholds to use. So saying um, why 0.1. Is that correct? Is that your question? Yeah. So that's a good question. So the, my answer would be to look at the literature and like look at what's normal in your field. Um, if you have like 10 really high quality studies and they all use the same threshold, you can justify from that. Haley, do you have a... Yeah, I, yeah, I would agree with that. Definitely look at other what other people have been doing with their with the same disease, the same SNPs, and the same population. If you don't have a similar sample to reference for those thresholds at all, then I would go with, um, I mean, defaults for software also are good to start with, but definitely reference back to the literature for your trait of interest and see what thresholds they're using. But what if you're starting something new, like how would you know what threshold you're supposed to be using? Mm -hmm. Good question. Um, when you say starting something new, are you talking about a trait that's never been studied before? I would start, say start the default and also look into the methods and try to understand the rationale for why certain thresholds were used. Because then if you have to customize it, you need to be able to justify it and like cite your sources. Um, so if you're doing something for a new trait, try and find something that's similar. Um, whether it's in prevalence, frequency, the disease, like etiology, try and find something similar if it's the first time you're doing it. I have a question about your uh, settings for the job. Mm -hmm. So I guess when running a new tool uh, figuring out how much ram and cpu these different pieces need would you say that using plink is typically more lightweight like you're only asking for one cpu and 10 gigs of ram uh i don't know if some of the other steps are a lot heavy mm -hmm. so does this plink step scale pretty big like is it ram heavy or and you're dealing with a little data set or is this kind of standard for what you need for most typical data sets um i'll repeat that for the people in zoom in case they didn't hear it um phil was asking about ram and knowing how much how many resources you need to allocate for a plink job um and he's asking about if this is consistent across plink file formats and sizes um so I'm going to answer first, and then I guess Haley can answer. Um, I think it depends on your data source. So something with a million SNPs will require less memory than something with 10 million SNPs, which will require less memory than imputed data, which is millions. Um, and you can do it by trial and error, where you subset a part of it and see how much memory that subset takes and then you can scale up by like multiplying it by a factor of 10 or 100. Um, that would be how I would approach strategies to scale up. Um, what do you think? Uh, I think it scales up pretty well. I've used it on a variety of different sizes of data sets and it usually runs pretty much the same for... Without needing too much more RAM. No, it's not. Uh, highly computationally uh, greedy software cool yeah Thanks. for sure um i'm going to show people what the fam looks like what two of the plank formats look like so a bim file has the genotype level data so on this left they don't have notably they don't have um column headers but if you google if you go into plank and then just search plank dot plank bim um it'll go into detail um so this is chromosome this is the rsid um, this is something that is arbitrary and not necessary. This is the base pair, and this is the major and minor. Um, and as you've noticed, there's ones that have RSIDs here, and then there's this a random SNP, whatever. This is because we're using one, one kg, like 1,000 genomes as our example data set. But please note that whatever individual level data you have, this will be different. So for my thesis, I used a data set called the CLSA, which is the Canadian Longitudinal Study on Aging, and they used an axiom array to do their genotyping. So I got this file and it had all these AX IDs, which were not RSIDs. So I had to do this whole step where I had to convert the AX IDs to RSIDs. It was very involved. So um, when you have your individual level data, you might have to do some extra steps to 
um, convert the SNPs into this RSID format. But if we do not convert the SNP file to the RSID, mm -hmm. will the playlist still run? Yeah, that's a good question. So it play will still run no matter what format the RSID in is, is in. Where it comes in handy is where it's you know applicable is when you're referencing. So for this example, we have thousand genomes as our individual level data. I'm using it as a reference panel, which is a device. I'll get into that later. I'm using it as a reference panel for our migraine data mm -hmm. or migraine SNP data. So those SNP IDs are all in the same format. Usually RSID is very general for the summary statistics. Mm -hmm. But if we're using a thousand genomes and we need those SNP variants in those RSID format, then that's where we would need to convert those because we want as many SNPs in our reference panel as are in our um, data set of interest okay. or data set that we're actually doing. Okay. Thank you. And sorry, I need to repeat the question for the mm -hmm. Zoom chat. Uh, the question was um, for, it was, why do we transfer the RSIDs? Uh, if we do not, whether the feeling still works, yes. then uh, well, what's the benefit of transfer? Okay, yeah, it was, if we don't transfer the RSIDs, will Plink still work? And Plink will still work whether, whatever um, format the RSIDs are in. It's just, mm -hmm. we're working with your data, um, having the um, variant names be the same is very um, necessary. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so Plink literally calls that column the variant identifier. So it can be identified as ABC. It can be identified as anything. Um, but for like Haley mentioned, like we're kind of using these outputs across different applications. It's I would recommend using RSID, but it isn't necessary. Um, so yeah, it really depends on what you're wanting to do. And the RSID maps to the position of the chromosome? Not quite. It depends. So Phil's question was so yeah. you can answer, but so, Phil's question was asking, does RSID map to position on the chromosome? Yeah, so that depends what what database or what um, build the RSID is mapped to. So they can be different positions based on the alignment. That makes sense. Yes, but it corresponds to a position on a reference genome, yeah. or is the allele information included as well? In this afternoon portion of this workshop, we're going to go into a SNP browser that shows um, it's a resource for seeing the allele frequency for each SNP. So a SNP is like a position, and you can have different alleles. Alleles are kind of variations of that SNP. So for example, RSID123 can have alleles C and A, C being the major, A being the minor. I'm just pulling it up. Um, and the reference build, it might be on position like ten, base pair 10,000 on one build, but it might be base pair 15,000 on a yeah. different build because the later build might have like an addition. They might have sequenced more like regions beforehand. So the absolute position might change depending on the build, but its position relative to the gene should be consistent. No, I'm or like that. annotated. Yeah, yeah. My, my question yeah. is when it comes to yeah. translating with RSIDs, mm -hmm. you're only carrying a chromosome and a position. You don't carry the actual genotypes because one RSID could have genotypes A, C, G, and T mm -hmm. associated to it. So that's, that was my question. Correct. Is the genotype included in the RSID? So, or is it just about the position? And I'm pretty sure it's just about the position. The RSID is a reference to the SNP database, which would include that allele information. So it maybe when we browse it, we'll, yeah, we'll, yeah, we'll back we'll, yeah, discuss. because you might have hypothetically a few minor alleles in a population. Like you might have 80% of the population has a little T, and then 10% has G, and then the 10% has C. Who knows? It really just depends on your data set. And that information is captured in Plink at the individual level. So person A might have a C, person B might have a T, 
in person, like the next, like you can you can have that individual level for the same RSID. So that if makes you sense. had two, if you had triallelic mm -hmm. site, would you get another row in your file here? A triallelic site. So, like, let's say, can you go back? So, on the on your terminal, you've got chromosome ID zero hmm. position major minor. Yeah. Let's say you had a C and A and a T at a position in a population. Does that get added as another row, or is it like another column? That hypothetically would be another column. But that isn't showing up here. Okay. So Phil's basically asking, like, if someone in, for example, this SNP seven eight one seven one six has a T allele, yeah, right. We only see A and G here. Mm -hmm. If you look at that individual level data, you would see a T. But that might get filtered out based on quality control steps because that might look like the erroneous SNP. Um, it also might not be common enough. It might not be common enough. So it's here. Yeah. In SPM, but only the common SNP larger than one percent will be show show up, or it will be removed by the quality controller. In this file, it's yes, yes, correct. And one percent, it would be, exactly. but it would be 0 0.0 there would be 0 0.05 percent because that's what we have on the minor little frequency threshold set. Oh yeah, we set right. up. Yeah, yeah, the the question. Okay. Yeah, the question was what. Um, alleles are going to show up in this file with our frequency threshold. Mm -hmm. okay. I have another practical question for this P -Lean. And once we see the P -Lean and the run, it has so many parameters to be set, but it didn't have the name of the input file. So this input file is all the file mm -hmm. within this working directory or? Mm -hmm. Okay. The input file is 1000G. Okay. And um, as you can see, that's here. Oh, yeah. So it's all kind of nested in here. But for example, if we have something called a 2000 G mm -hmm. and uh, we need another uh, peeling command line, set B file 2000 G, even yeah. if it's in mm -hmm. the same folder. Yeah. You said oh, B like, file, it, yes, correct. The okay. question was um, to what in the plink, the peeling code is the input file, and that would be the B file. And that B file flag is indicating that that's a plink, or a plink formatted file. So that you just have to do 1000G and it'll pull 1000G bed bin. And, and, oh, no. Okay, BAM and bin mm -hmm. folks. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All three of them, yes. Yeah. So BAM uh, necessary for? Yes. Okay, so, so BAM, BIM, FAM, and the log all are needed. Correct. Oh. The log is not, not log. Oh, the log. Not log is generally the log just has an output from all the output. Okay. But a bad beam and a satellite needed. Okay. Thank you, folks. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so the log. Oh, um, so basically, he was asking: um, Is the f dot fam dot bim and dot bed all required? And that is correct. And when you're inputting, when you're setting the input flag, you use B file. Um, and it's basically the name of your data, so 1000G for us. But please note how I do not have the extension of .bed or .fam or .bim after this, because all of these do need to be named the same. So like, it needs to be the same. The same file prefix. Same yeah. file prefix. Um, so I'm just going to look at the log, because he also asked about the log. Um, Oh, this is from when, so this is, Never mind. so the log is from when I converted the original 1000 Genomes BCF file to a plink file. Um, so if you guys wanted that code, oh, it's not in here, but this is, so the log is just the output from the plink command. Um. So um, the other file that we just went over was the BIM file, but this is the FAM file. So again, to just kind of go over what that means. Um, this is the kind of like, I, I highly recommend that you just Google everything like this. Like it's quite straightforward. So we have family ID and then within family ID, 
Um, so you might actually have related individuals in your data set. And a common practice is to remove, like to only keep one of someone who's within a three degrees of relative, like a three FDR, um, a three first degree relative. Um, and this is demarcated um, in these columns. Um, so this person has a family ID of 96 um, and an individual ID, IID, as 96. So what this means is that if anyone else in the second row had H96 in the first column, they would be related. They would be assigned the same family ID. And you can do quality on that. Yeah, sure. Um, so the first column is the family ID, FID. Second column is individual ID, IID. And relatedness can be tracked in this individual level data when you see multiple people with the same family ID. And that is captured by the, by, um, there's a few ways you can capture that information. One is by self-report. So if the people are in a study and they say, oh yes, this person is my uncle, then the researchers can just input that. But there's also ways to do it computationally. Mm -hmm. There's genomic relatedness matrices, which is um, a way to calculate for each individual, how related are they to the next individual? And so you can um, threshold how related you want people in your study to be based on this genomic relatedness matrices. And I think it's over like 0 0.01. I think it's, it, it, there's specific thresholds for like degrees of relatedness of cousins and um, siblings, yeah. Um, we do this a lot and sometimes we have twins. So sometimes mm -hmm. we have like, or you have mismatches and stuff. How do you know which one to keep, which one to get rid of? Ooh. So the question was, if we have twins or people who are related, how do you know which one to keep and which one to throw out? Mm -hmm. So you have question. to get random usually. How do you run? So in the past, so what Haley said and what I agree with is that you randomly choose. Like you should not, you should not introduce bias <laughs> by choosing the first of the pair or like the oldest of the pair. How would you know? Like if you keep like not just all. The you can set a seed. Like there's different ways in R if you Google like how to randomly choose, like random number generator, and you can um, assign a random number and just choose like, like for example, all the pairs have a number of one to fifty, and then um, you would get a random number generator to be like, okay, you choose one, seven, 10, that's your people. Like you could figure it out. Depending. Yeah, for twin oh, studies, yeah. there's usually very specific um, methods for randomly selecting like mixed mm -hmm. methods for picking mm -hmm. one twin out of two, but I don't know if it's, you have a whole family study and you have twins within that family or if it's just a twin study. Well, sometimes we have a big study and we don't know if that there are twins oh. involved mm -hmm. in the study. So we don't want to mm -hmm. have that mismatch and then we just have to get rid of one. But then I was wondering mm -hmm. how to get rid of that individual. Mm -hmm. Without mm -hmm. actually do some bias or anything. Mm -hmm. You would just identify from the thing that Haley mentioned that they're related and then just randomly choose one without looking more. But of note, depending on people's applications, you might want to do representative sampling. So like there might be a research design where you want to try and have a representative sample. Because if you randomly get everyone who's older by accident, like, do you want that, right? Mm -hmm. um, or like of a certain ethnicity or sorry, ancestry, genetic ancestry. Um, so it is, it's a good question. <laughs> um, I have one more question. Okay, cool. I completely derail your, your flow here. Mm -hmm. um, how, where, where do you draw the bounds on family? Usually it's third degree relative. Okay. Oh, second cousin. Okay. <laughs> like if you go up the tree a couple of times, like degrees of relatives, it has to do with like nodes on a on a pedigree. So like, okay. for example, your parents and your siblings and your kids are all first degree relatives. Mm -hmm. Your grandparents are a second degree relative. Okay. Your grandparents, like depend like oh, it's like how many steps in the node you have to go essentially okay. yeah 
So if, if, if there's any familial relatedness, it will probably go to be considered. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and reminder is that relatedness can cause inflation in your genetic results. Like you might see more of one allele by chance um, if you have a lot of related people. And um, another important thing to consider when you're looking at relatedness is um, disease prevalence as far as shared environment. So if you're looking at a family study, disentangling the genetic from the environment, the shared environment is a very weedy study of interest. Like Haley's really into that study of like basically disentangling twin studies, like how much is genetic nature versus nurture, essentially. Um, so if you're deciding to keep in people who are related, like you need to somehow have something in your methods about accounting for the shared environment. Yes, there's that's I mean, in the complex methods there. Complex. What I, but there is so um, GCTA, a tool I'm going to be talking about later, is um, one tool you can use for making a genomic relatedness matrix and um, get that piece of data. Indeed. Um, what else is there? Because most of this is, oh yeah, GWAS prep. Okay. So for the last little bit, um, we can go into, I have my RMD up here. Um, so, um, this is all in the GitHub and all in the repo, like on the scratch directory as well. Um, so I did copy a lot of these things into the slide deck, like the key things. Um, this is actually an old version. Okay, so we have a few packages that we need. Like I use the tidyverse as like a rule of thumb, always use the tidyverse. Again, this is kind of a workshop that assumes you know what R and R Studio is and HPC stuff. So if you're kind of confused what, what everything is, please ask the TAs or refer to the um, earlier workshops. And the package that I used for creating the Manhattan plots was this thing called GWARS. So you have to install that package if you don't have it. The Run Our Studio shell script um, is something that Phil made and I think covered it last week, but we also have that in our home directory here. Um, RunRStudio.sh is here. So if you were to copy this into your student space, like you should have it. So it's not very sure for them. So mm -hmm. it's not sure about that. Mm -hmm. Um, oh, it's not under the shared folder. It's just in the SNP associations folder. So it's not in the shared folder. Yeah, you can just queue set it from right here. Um, so this I kind of covered in the slides. I put some excerpts about migraine here. Um, and this is all stuff that I put in. Um, blah, 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 blah. So this is stuff I copied, da, 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 da. So for creating a JSON file, um, this is the thing that I encourage everyone to kind of try and self-teach or walk through using the links here. Um, but in sum, there is a shell script um, that is downloadable from here. It's a script that honestly I did not write, um, but I can answer questions about it if you have questions in the interim, because um, I had to use it for my thesis and a JSON file, um, which you can um, edit as you see fit. So what that looks like, oh, mm, I thought I had it there. Um, yeah, it's right there. Mm. Okay, that's weird. You guys can all see that. Oh, it's migraine with no S. There we go. No, I, I added an S, but I shouldn't have. <laughs> oh, I'm trying to look at this one. Oh, migraine female. Sorry, everybody. Okay, cool. So this is what the JSON file looks like. Um, so again, instructions are on the GitHub page. And basically you're trying to tell the JSON, how is the summer statistics file um, needing to be standardized. So basically you're um, labeling each column as is like the raw summary statistics data into a standardized output format. And a standardized output format will be these things in um, quotation marks. 
And this parse calls is the thing that I showed in the slide deck because um, in the raw data for the Neil lab sum stats, they have the chromosome, the base pair position, the effect, and the other allele all separated by a set of colon here. Um, so you can change your initials here. This, this is the genome build that you have to articulate if it's going in versus out. Um, there's different paths. You can change the paths here. Um, and then change the sample size here as best as you can. This isn't going to affect the standardized output um, too much. It's just like a label for yourself to know. Um, and then you basically you run the script with a very simple code um, right here. So after you make your GWAS JSON script, um, you want to have the GWAS launch script in the same directory. And then um, this is the GWAS sum stats, migraine female. And then this is the location of the GWAS, the, G, the JSON file that we just talked about. And 1.8 is the approximate size of the sum stat in gigabytes. Um, so you can see that, um, for example, here, um, it was like 1.6 or like 1.8 here. So migraine underscore female underscore raw um, was like 1.8 GB. So that's how I know what number to put in that little bit right there. Um, yeah. So the last bit is once you have an output is to label them into columns for use in downstream applications. Um, so for example, um, these are the main ones. We want to have SNP ID, chromosome number, base pair number, A1, A2, which are the major and minor, um, and the odds ratio or the beta value, which is the test statistic, standard error and the p-value. Um, so everyone has different ways that they do this. I just like using tidyverse. I like using the select function. Again, like this is just a personal preference for how I do this. Um, and one of the applications in this afternoon is using this program called Precise. Um, so to put things into Precise, you need them to have these specific column names, like SNP and CAPS, chromosome and CAPS, BP and CAPS. So this is specific to downstream application for this afternoon, but this is not required for fine mapping or like other stuff per se. Yeah, I have another script for the file formatting for fine mapping, which is almost basically the same, except you need the end. Exactly. So, so yeah. This is kind of like a resource for any people who are kind of curious about how to manipulate SNP data. Like, I'm not going over this in depth because I want you to explore these packages and what these code lines mean. I did kind of articulate them. Um, but this is like just a resource that you can have on hand to look at for inspiration, perhaps. <laughs> and like maybe copy things if you'd like. Like, I didn't have this kind of tool when I was figuring my stuff out. So, like, I hope that this can be helpful. <laughs> Even if you use like only one line of code, like hopefully it can be a starting point for everybody or for anybody who's curious about it. Um, yeah, I, that's it for me. Do you have anything else you wanna say? Oh, um, I think for the afternoon session, if you all have a, um, a trait of interest that you wanna download the sum stats for, um, we do have the option of, you know, changing out code so that you can apply it to your own data. So, um, yeah, that's really all I have to say. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I guess now we can just kind of open the floor for questions or just hang out um, and try this out yourself. Um, hope you enjoyed the first session <laughs> and see you all at 12. Um, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yay.